Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Desert Gardening News, a Star Nursery podcast. We are so excited to be celebrating our holidays with you, and we have a lot planned for this episode. Today, our hosts are our staff arborist, Joey Lynn, and staff horticulturist, Paul, who's also known as Dr. Q. Hello, welcome Hi, back. Hi, everybody. <laughs> In this month's episode, we are very excited to be talking about our December tips and tricks for our seasonal items, as well as our winter color and a little bit of frost protection even. Um, We've got a lot to get through, so we can just get started. Well, our Dr. Q team is here, and they're going to be telling us everything that we need to know for the month. So to get started... um, Based off of your guys' experience in the stores, what would you say our most popular winter item is? I don't know that there's a particular single item, but right now uh, uh, you want to focus on some cold-tolerant plants. And there are a lot of colorful cold-tolerant plants that, that you can be used this, this time of year. My personal favorite is the cyclamen. I love that little flower, Uh, even call it my anniversary flower. My husband gets me flats of it for our anniversary, and uh, they come in every color, red and purple and white and pink, and uh, I typically have those all the way through spring to Valentine's Day. I think that's a great little uh, flower. Um, That's my favorite. Yeah, those are actually really good, colorful plants that uh, can be used indoors or outside in in a garden in a a semi-shaded area. Um, But that's just one of of several things out that are very colorful during the cold weather, like uh, uh, the ornamental cabbage and kale are very colorful this time of year uh, because of the cold weather. And they'll last till it starts starts to warm up a little bit. But uh, along with those, there's, uh, uh, there's also pansies and mm-hmm. snapdragons and uh, a lot of the, the cool season colorful flowers that, that are used in, in December and January uh, and into February till it warms up. And for pansies, snapdragon, cyclamen, what kind of tips can you give our audience about their care? Well, you you just want to make sure that they do get water, but it doesn't have to be very much in the cold weather, uh, which is true for most plants. When the air temperature and the soil temperature is uh, cooler, then plants dry out a lot slower. The, the soil holds the moisture longer. So you just want to make sure that that you let the surface of the soil, whether it be in a pot or in the ground, that you let it dry out to the touch a bit between waterings. And then make sure and give them a, you know, a fairly decent amount of water to get that whole root zone um, uh, moistened. And then just wait till that surface dries out again between waterings. I think also using some Dr. Q's plant tonic in your water um, in those infrequent waterings is a good idea too to keep them uh, just a little bit of root stimulant. We're not adding any real heavy fertilizers or anything like that, but we're giving them some micronutrients just to keep their roots stimulated, just just so that they stand upright and uh, possibly push some new little flowers if if that's the flower that you're choosing. I know cyclamen, my favorite. <laughs> I can never get enough of that little plant. Um, they'll push up new flowers all winter, and uh, it's it's a slow process for them, but they always look great. So I always use a little Dr. Q's plant tonic in my winter flowers. Yeah, that's that's great to use for all plants, especially during periods of possible stress, like extra cold or extra hot weather. Uh, plants will go into a little bit of a stress period, and the Dr. Q's plant tonic or any root stimulant will really help them to get through those periods a little better. And probably should mention, too, is that um, when you're looking around in the nurseries this time of year for cool season plants, there's a lot of other bedding plants like like stocks and uh, primroses and things like that that do bloom in the cool season, uh, which a lot of people don't realize how many flowers do that. 
and some shrubs that will change colors in the winter, the fall and winter, so that they're always putting on different colors throughout the season. The Nandina does that. Um, we'll also, some boxwoods will do that. We have the, the winter boxwood that will actually kind of bronze. And the, and the pyracantha berries. And the pyrac- Orange and red during the cold weather in the fall and winter. Uh, a lot of things that the cool weather actually colors them up. Uh, uh, so you get that benefit during the cool weather and it's not so sterile looking. Yeah. Uh, succulents. Your succulents right now might be really, really uh, putting on a red color um, for winter. And that's not anything to be afraid of with the succulents or the cactus. What you want to worry about is freezing. So um, those coming into December, you might actually start considering uh, covering, covering, covering those, but, uh, still watering the succulents on schedule, meaning when they need it, they do still need water, the succulents, not, but not much, not much and not often. The, yeah. the trick with them is to give them a good watering when you do water, but let them dry out. Well, you know, you may only have to water them once, once a month. Yeah. You know, if and depending on what the temperatures are, but also with the cactus and uh, and some succulents, especially the ones that aren't native to our Mojave Desert, which a lot of them aren't because we bring them in from other other deserts or other areas where uh, they are cold sensitive. So you do have to cover them up. Some of the varieties that won't take the extreme cold, they need protection. You know, covering with burlap or insulation uh, when the temperatures are forecast to be uh, right around freezing or below. Mm-hmm. You don't have to keep them covered all the time. The covering should be removed when the weather warms up in the morning so that they can get sunlight to photosynthesize during the uh, warmer part of the day. And a good for any of the posts any of the post cactus you know you can just get a styrofoam cup and just right on top (laughs) yeah because all the new growth comes right off the top and that's Mm -hmm. where all the tender new growth which is the most sensitive to the cold uh, needs protection so yeah a large styrofoam cup put over it or a small cardboard box uh, or anything to protect them from that frost right on the top because you'll see the difference in that new growth is a much lighter color where the bottom part of the stem has been hardened off more. It's a darker green and more leathery. That one can usually uh, take the cold or mm-hmm. fairly much, but that new growth has to be protected. So while we're on the subject of frost, what other, what other plants might need some frost protection um, right now in this season? Citrus. Most important, especially young citrus. More mature, larger citrus don't always need it, don't necessarily need it, unless we have a really, really deep plunging uh, temperature drop, right? Yeah, they can normally take it down to, uh, well, more established citrus Mm -hmm. can take it uh, like down to maybe 28, 29 degrees. Uh, because they're they're at more acclimated to the cold after several seasons in the ground, and if it does get colder than that, normally what'll happen because the frost drops straight down is that you'll only get the top layer of leaves slightly burned if they're not covered or protected. So, and that's easily trimmed off Mm -hmm. as soon as the cold weather's over with. So the rest of the tree is pretty much protected and it's not going to have damage. But the young trees, young ones that are newly planted, they're susceptible uh, because they're smaller, there's less foliage covering them and they should really have a uh a uh an insulated blanket or or burlap or something that's gonna or even building a tent Mm -hmm. with stakes and plastic around it like a tent will actually protect them from the cold as well and as we've talked over and over again about citrus they are grafted so in addition I always recommend that a young citrus newly planted should have that graft part 
covered and protected. So we sell foam pipe insulation and you can just, they, it, it's, it separates and opens up and you can get that pipe uh, foam and cover where the graft is. And that's very helpful too, because where that graft is, we don't want any damage. So uh, the graft is where we have a root stock and then the actual citrus is grafted onto that. So protecting that with burlap or blanket as well is also really helpful. And then on the cold nights, you cover the, the, canopy of the citrus and then you take it off in the morning um, and let that breathe and going back to what you were saying that if it's a mature tree and we get a frost and it's too large and you would not have been able to cover it you can prune that but be aware when you prune the citrus we don't over prune because that's going to affect your harvest in the future so you just remove the damaged parts um, so that you don't clear out the whole plant in in its uh next year's harvest (laughs) yeah and you don't want to prune it until the danger of frost is over because if you prune it too soon then you expose the the green leaves Mm -hmm. that have been protected by that that frost damaged uh, layer on top and then they're just going to burn again which that's kind of what we talk about each season when we talk about pruning, huh? Is that you wait until the the harmful extremes of that season, you're out of the danger zone so that anything that was being protected by that layer doesn't just all of a sudden get exposed and then you continue uh, the damage even further into the plant. So we, we always want to uh, protect that. And the other thing with citrus is if you still have fruit on the plant and we're about to freeze um you have two choices you cover that or you harvest uh because there's nothing worse than you sitting and waiting on a tree to harvest your citrus and then it all freezes and uh you have frost damaged fruit (laughs) yeah and that happens a lot with citrus because if they freeze the inside gets really pulpy Mm -hmm. And so you lose all that juice. I know. And also, there's some citrus that would be ever bearing that might um, have some blooms that have set just maybe a couple weeks ago with Meyer some sun. Lemons. Yep. And so those you want to be aware of and you want to protect them by covering them as well. Uh, structures are amazing. People get so creative with creating a uh, protective structure with uh, lodge poles and uh, shade cloth or even just blankets um, that's some some people even put outdoor little heaters or wrap yeah, the trees in lights lights that, that as long as they're not uh, incandescent lights that get real hot and do damage you don't want that but you want something that will just put out a little bit of heat to because it it's only a matter of you know, maybe two or three degrees that you need to protect mm-hmm. them from, uh, from from freeze damage. So if you do that, uh, a lot of times that's that's all they really need for protection. Paul, why don't you talk about the biology of the plant during cold and why what actually happens with the freeze? Well, on on evergreen plants, you've got. Uh, the upper and lower surface of the leaf and in between you've got all the uh, the cells that are uh, the veins that are carrying uh, uh, water and nutrients to the leaves and also the uh, um, that are actually helping to photosynthesize and produce food so when it gets extremely cold uh, the inside tissue, if that freezes, that's what actually damages the leaves. And that's true also for extreme heat, because extreme heat can do the same type of damage and destroy that interior tissue inside. And that's what will cause a lot of the, the discoloration, browning of leaves, whether it be extreme heat or extreme cold, uh, you get the same results. The leaves are going to die because they can't continue to function like they're supposed to. So that's what you have to protect from on on uh, evergreen plants. Now, that is 
goes for evergreen plants, but deciduous plants, and that goes for fruit trees as well as other shrubs and trees, is the trees that are deciduous, they lose their leaves naturally every fall and winter. They completely shed them off. So you don't have to worry as much about um, protecting them because they're down to now just the... uh, uh, the bark tissue on the stems and everything, which actually produ- uh, protects the interior of the stems from freezing because mm-hmm. that's an insulation, that bark, that uh, prevents that. So you don't really have to protect those deciduous plants. You can let them go through the winter, and they norm- normally will survive it quite quite well. I know of very few deciduous plants that will actually freeze unless our ground actually freezes, mm-hmm. which we're lucky enough to not have that happen here. But, you know, in the very cold climates where the ground may freeze down to a foot or two, then you run into the chance of the plant actually getting killed from the roots being frozen. So, but that's something we don't have to worry about here. Um, so I have a question about vines, actually, and what maybe we can expect from the cold season and how that's going to affect our vines, whether they're deciduous, semi-deciduous, um, especially bougainvillea. I feel like a lot of people in the valley have bougainvillea right now. Yeah, actually, bougainvillea has been, been uh, very much more popular during the last few years because we've been warmer uh, several years ago, say 15, 20 years ago, when we were getting colder uh, winters, bougainvilleas pretty much were grown as just a uh, annual plant here. Bougainvilleas, hibiscus, some of the other more tropical plants, but bougainvilleas are a good vine. Um, but uh, again, uh, now that it's being warmer here, we can actually grow them and they come back in the spring, but they will lose all the leaves in the winter. Whereas in coastal areas like California or Florida or, you know, Hawaii, where they, they pretty much grow year round as evergreen plants. But, but here they go dormant, lose their leaves with the cold weather that we do have, but normally they will come back. So, um, you can help protect the leaves that are on it by covering them uh, when f- frost is forecast mm-hmm. uh, with some kind of a, a insulation or burlap or whatever. And if it gets cold enough, they still may um, may f- do uh, frost damage to the leaves, mm-hmm. but the stem should still stay alive. And uh, if anything, if we get a real hard frost, it might kill some of the younger stems from the top down Mm -hmm. a little bit. But if you can scratch the the stems and get green, they're still alive and viable, and they should leaf back out as soon as the weather warms up. And with bougainvillea, it is thought that if you can get them through the first couple few winters, the more reliable they're going to be. And... That is also a a vine that will actually sprout back up. You may think that you see a lot of top damage with that, but it will actually sprout up from the roots and new vining will happen. So um, that that can all be addressed in spring when you really know what you're looking at as far as what's bouncing back and what's not and how to prune. But there's also a lot of people that also will lay the vine down, cover it with mulch or um, even uh, straw and keep it close to the ground where what Paul was talking about, the temperatures of our soil are not near freezing. And so they'll lay the vines down, uh, protect them, and then come spring when they're starting to, we're starting to warm up, we'll then prop the vines back up. Now, Bougainvillea are kind of a spiky vine to do that with, (laughs) but the younger plant parts, you can certainly do that with it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the thing is with bougainvillea is they grow so fast during the warm weather that uh, a lot of that, that growth you're trying to protect, you, you could 
basically cut off a mm. lot of it to short stems and there the stems will either come back if you cover them with straw and that is a good insulation by the way even for protection mm. on citrus crowns or uh uh, graphs. Uh, that's a good insulation for anything keeping the frost damage. Just bury them in, in straw uh, or mulch of mm-hmm. some kind. But uh, but yeah, you can. It, it used to be that uh, bougainvilleas you could count on freezing all the way to the ground, and then you'd have to rely on them sprouting back up from the roots. But um, nowadays, a lot of that lower stem will sprout back out again mm-hmm. too. But they grow so fast that. that when you cut them back, it just makes them bushier when they come back in the spring so that you don't have the long stringy branches. Uh, you cut them back, they flush out with new growth that's much more compact and bushy. But then by the end of the summer, they're going to go be back out to eight or 10 feet long because they grow so fast during the warm weather. Let's talk a little bit about the Tacoma bells and what people might be experiencing through December that really catches them off guard because they perform so well in the summer. Um, talk a little bit about the what 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 is s- semi deciduous yeah. and what vines or plants could fall into that. Whereas if we get really cold this winter, you might see changes that you've never seen before in these plants. Yeah, that's true. Um, there are, there are deciduous and evergreen and, and semi deciduous plants. And that just means that they, uh, in warmer climates, they'll stay green all year round. Things like, uh, um, Texas sage are one of the shrub varieties, the Tacoma bells. Uh, uh, there's there's several other plants of bougainvilleas uh, we talked about and several other plants that uh, if it gets cold enough, they will drop most of their leaves. Some of them, like the Texas rangers, may drop about 50 to 60, 75 percent of their foliage, but then uh, depending on how cold it gets. But then as soon as it warms up, they just flush back out with new growth. Um, now, some things like the Tacoma varieties, like the yellow bells, orange jubilee bells, and sub- several other of the bell varieties, they're gonna they're gonna either partially defoliate, or they're going to get frost damage on all of their leaves and totally defoliate. Uh, but all you need to do is trim them back again. Uh, it's best to trim them back. You could leave them go, but the thing about that is, is that again, when they start growing in the spring, you're going to have to deal with long stringy mm-hmm. branches. And one of the things to remember on all plants is that the preference for new growth is on the ends of the branches. So what you're going to ha- have to do is when you're going to see them sprouting out in the spring, if you leave those long branches, all the new growth is going to come out on the ends of those branches, and you're going to see a lot of brown stems on lantana, on bells. Several other varieties of plants are like that. That's why we recommend that in um, in January or early February, uh, when the real chance of dangerous frost is over, you cut these plants back to like lantanas back to three or four Mm -hmm. inches like the bell varieties back to maybe uh two two feet or so foot and a half to two feet depending on how old the the bush is maybe you leave um you know that much on it uh but that allows them to sprout out with their new growth in a more compact bushy form so that you have a nice even bush when it starts growing out and then again the hotter the weather gets the faster those stems are going to grow and you're going to have long sprouts back to six or eight feet like they were before you cut them so fantastic and we are going to have pruning seminars in january early early next month so have your eyes out on our uh social media so that you can get on our registration for them they fill up quickly we're going to have multiple locations um multiple pruning experts come in and do that so please be 
on our social media, be on our website and get registered for those as soon as they open up. Um, and then that's when we'll go into detail about pruning and fertilizing and all that, uh, which is nothing we really want you doing right now. Cause we want all those kind of mature plant parts to protect, uh, the inner's of the plants and how they function. Yep, absolutely. And that's uh, real important pruning. And, it, and, and uh, it varies between different types of plants, which we'll cover during those seminars. So we talked about protecting our citrus. What about our fruit trees? If it is a deciduous fruit tree that goes dormant, you do not need to worry about protecting them from the frost. There are specific chilling hours that deciduous fruit trees need to be able to store up enough energy to produce that fruit. Depending on what fruit tree you have or what fruit tree you're interested in, go to our website. We have star notes under gardening advice that talks all about different fruit trees, whether it's a peach or an apricot, even our nuts, um, cherry trees, and it will actually variety by variety tell you how many chilling hours are necessary to produce the fruit that that variety is supposed to produce so we have a lot of information on that kind of a little bit too much to go into right now but if you have a peach tree you don't need to be protecting it it needs to go dormant and have its quiet time in this uh nice cold chill we call it chilling hours yeah and by chilling hours it's actually the number of hours that the temperatures are below 40 degrees so certain types of fruit take more chilling hours to produce well some a lot less but you can get all that information on our website and a good general guide is about 200 chilling hours here for the desert southwest so uh we're in las vegas nevada um mesquite gets a little bit more chilling hours than us Mm -hmm. right we've got our utah elevations uh even um i think pahrump even has a a few more chilling hours than more chilling hours yeah too so here in uh las vegas and parts, some parts of Arizona, we do think that you should stay around 200. That seems to be a very doable winter for us. I love that um, it's not just sweater weather for our human population, but for our plant <laughs> populations as well. And we do kind of sell little plant parkas that you can pick up at our store, especially for our palm trees. So if you have a palm tree that you need to get some protection on as well, um, I'm not sure what the name of them are called, but I know they're like a blanket it, that you wrap around. It is a plant it is parka. A, it's, is that palm, what it's a called? palm parka. Or palm. There palm you go. Parka. Palm oh, parka. Oh, wow, close. <laughs> and it is. It's like a very large sleeping bag yeah. that has Velcro. And so it's reusable each year. Uh, there are... Tree companies, if you have very, very large queen palms, let's say, for instance, um, there are companies that will come out and get on a big boom truck, a big lift, and they'll wrap them for you, which is a good idea. It's a good idea. The negative of that is you're hiring somebody to come and do it, but then you also have to rehire them to come out. So the timing of it coming off is important uh, because you don't want them to swelter or have moisture up there and they be wrapped up in these. uh, And it's not all palms that need to be wrapped. There's only a few varieties that are that frost tender here. Like the queen palm, uh, especially younger ones, should probably be protected for a few years. And the like pygmy date palms, are are also another one those two are probably the most prevalent ones you need unless you've got some real exotic mm-hmm. type palms uh from uh, more tropical areas but most of the palms that we see growing here in the valley like the mexican fan palm california fan palm mediterranean fan palm windmill fan palm those actually all take the cold fairly mm-hmm. well and they really don't need to be wrapped at all during the winters the last tip for you know preparing for frost and cold weather, um, one protective measure you want to take is with your irrigation systems. And we do sell frost protection for the irrigation systems if you'd like to talk a little bit about that. 
Yeah, we actually have several uh, things for frost protection for irrigation. Anything, any exposed pipes that are above ground are susceptible to freezing uh, if the temperatures get low enough. So we sell like a, a foam pipe wrap uh, that you can either uh, wrap around, uh, it comes in a roll, or we've got the actual uh, long tubular uh, pipe covers that have a split in them that you can put right over pipe. Uh, it's actually protection. Uh, and those are for just exposed pipe, whether it be for pools or for irrigation. Uh, you want to protect those when temperatures are, are extremely low, uh, get, getting well below 30 degrees, you take the chance of that water in the pipes freezing. And if it does, it can break the pipes if it freezes because that water is going to expand as it turns to ice. So you want those protected in, in, uh, in times of extreme cold. And we sell for the PVB, which is the um, unit that stops any outside water from going inside your house so your irrigation system has what's called a pressure valve breaker and it will prevent any outside irrigation water from coming into your house and that is above ground and there's it's a brass unit and that does freeze and that is a very expensive fix so we have uh protectors pvb protectors that are these envelopes they're kind of like um insulated envelopes that just slide right over and we also have faucet protectors that you fix you affix over your faucet and so that no water that's left in there uh could expose and all of those brass units get very costly to to uh repair so the pvb valve is probably the most expensive part of your irrigation system uh so that's something that you really need to protect it's also just a good habit to be checking in on your irrigation system from time to time even on maybe a monthly basis if you have the time just to check in on it maybe with the fall you had some leaves drop in there like clear that all out when you can and when you uh, get a chance to look into that Yeah, and actually two other things, points for for cold weather protection is one, uh, if they're forecasting extremely cold temperatures, you might want to throw blankets over all of your pool uh, equipment, you know, the the pump, the filters, uh, because any of those exposed uh, PVB uh, pipes uh, or the... uh, um, any of that pipe work, if it has water in it and extremely cold temperatures, it can crack those pipes. So even just covering it with a blanket or insulation of some kind. And the and the other thing is on your irrigation system is if they're forecasting extremely cold temperatures, what you want to do is go and find the end of your irrigation line and it should have a cap on it. And take it off and drain the line so that it has no water in it that can freeze and break the lines. Because that's actually possible too. We don't have that bad a problem here because again, normally our ground does not freeze. But if we for some strange reason get temperatures down into the the low 20s or teens, then you have to be very careful about that, that, that water supply freezing. Well, I think we've gone over some awesome tips for this month that I hope our audience will be able to use as they're getting through the winter months. Um, I'd also just like to point out that our weather here in the desert is changing on a yearly basis, and we might be seeing weather that is completely different from last year and um, expect the unexpected, basically, and plan for the unexpected. Maybe check on your weather app from you know the beginning of the week and just get a forecast for the week and see what you can do to really protect your plants because you, you just want to make sure that your landscape has longevity at the end of the season. And the weather.com... You can go back in history and you can get what uh, our first freeze was last year and use that to kind of get an idea if you're going to be traveling for the holidays. Um, you can try to do a little bit of a projection. Um, you can also go to Old Farmer's Almanac 
um, and put in your zip code and get really precise um, expectations of your area so that you don't have to worry about that stuff. Good advice. Thank you guys so much for your expertise on our tips and tricks for December. Um, now we're going to get into some really fun stuff. We have seasonal items right now in all of our locations, and those are including our live Christmas trees, Christmas cactus, poinsettias, live wreaths. We've got live garland. Um, there's so much to really get your landscape or your home feeling extra holiday spirited. Um, and we want to make sure that those items that you pick up last you for a long time and they can. So um, today we're going to be getting into, you know, care tips for your Christmas trees and um, for all of our seasonal items. So let's start with Christmas trees. Uh, I know that every we're all excited for Christmas trees. It's probably so, like, one of the most fun times of the year for Star Nursery. I am so excited that this time of year is here. We have so much fun in the stores. The stores are crazy busy with people and families and puppies and everything you can everybody you can imagine coming in to get their Christmas tree it is one of the best traditions uh, to grab a little red wagon as you come in with your family and to go through our yards to find the most perfect Christmas tree is just uh, things I cherish forever. Uh, every one of us here have been fortunate enough to work the holiday seasons in the stores, uh, preparing each Christmas tree as it gets ready to be sold, which it's a lot of work. So if you go into the stores, please thank everybody there at the stores for all their hard work and making this a memorable part of the season. But Paul, you have been actually going and picking out star nursery christmas trees for years and years and years you have headed this uh big feat for how long now well it's probably been uh, it's probably been about uh 25 years now that i've been involved with the christmas trees um I'm starting to uh, turn that over to Joey Lynn well, now, but um, and a couple other people in our purchasing departments. So, uh, but it is a great time of year. It gives everybody, our employees and our customers, puts them all in a great spirit, great great mood, so that everybody's happy. Uh, and uh, and that's what's what's good about it. It's a, such a joyous part of the year that everybody involved in it, whether it be uh, our employees or our customers, are very excited to, to come out uh, shopping for holiday plants, holiday trees, you know, and decorating their house. And uh, yeah, it's a big, uh, big, big deal for us. And we put in a lot of uh, work to, to get it perfect every year. So it's it's and we've grown. It's it's something that has grown, uh, like Madeline was saying, how uh, we have the garland and the wreaths now. That is an incredible addition. If you have not seen them, uh, they're just absolute beautiful swags um, and wreaths. And if you go to a store and they're not displayed, do not fear. They may be in a huge garbage can just soaked in water uh, to keep them fresh. But, Paul, early on, uh, you've always gone and visited the uh, Christmas tree farms, haven't you? Yeah, that's pretty much standard with our company. We want to make sure that uh, we're checking on the growers. We have growers up in uh, Washington State and, uh, and Oregon. Uh, where the trees we get our trees from the farms are up there and they are farms and that's something we like to stress to people uh, that may think that no you're cutting down trees you know out of a forest to get you know uh, Christmas trees we don't like that well d please don't think that way mm -hmm. because the the thing is is that the trees that are sold for Christmas are grown on farms, just like a lot of our, our food is grown on farms. Uh, it's specifically grown in areas where they're planted, they're cultivated, they're taken care of for anywhere from uh, five to to seven or eight years to get, uh, you mm -hmm. know, a nice looking tree, depending on the size you're, you're looking for. But they're, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, they are uh, specifically grown just for the purpose of selling for holiday trees. 
So the, a lot of work goes into that fertilizing, trimming, um, but but doing that, it it actually gives people jobs. Mm-hmm. It uh, it actually cleans our air because all of those trees, while they're growing and uh, into Christmas trees, are. Uh, are, are taking carbon dioxide out of the air and they're putting oxygen back in the air. So they are continuing to do what every other plant and tree does, only they do it in a greater quantity because they are on these farms that are just rows and rows mm-hmm. and rows of these trees. And, uh, and it is uh, an example of, uh, uh, you know, being able to put people to work, being able to uh, uh, clean our air, and being able to give people a holiday Christmas tree to decorate in their home. And our farmers are very responsible, uh, very um, aware of our conditions and everything, and the way that they farm are is just amazing. You know, I got to go this year, and it was so exciting. Um, it does take about seven years, and they have full um, fields that will go through a process. Like, so f- this year, the seven footers that were uh, planted seven years ago, those fields will be cleared, and all of them, but they practice cover uh, crops now. So that land will rest for a year or even just a season and they will come back and they will, uh, plant a year later, but that earth has been given the opportunity to rest and they're planting uh, buckwheat or something, some kind cover of cover crops. crop, um, in that area. And it's just really amazing. And what I didn't know is that there is no supplemental irrigation with our farmers. So there is not a loss of water. They are strong strictly relying on what mother nature gives them. They use the swales. They use, they put um, the Nordmans in the areas that need more water and the uh, Douglas firs that don't like a lot of water. They have them on high ground. I learned so much. It was just the most amazing trip to be able to see the process, see these farmers and they're small companies family owned uh that have just so much pride in what they do and what they produce for us and we've had long-standing relationships with them um talk a little bit about the different types of christmas trees that you can find in our stores this year yeah we basically uh there's several types of trees that are grown throughout the country uh used for christmas trees but uh it depends on where where you're from the region the three types that we have available from our uh, um our our suppliers are the douglas fir uh the uh Nordman fir and the noble fir. All of those grow very well in uh, areas up in Washington, southern Washington and northern uh, Oregon, and which is where the farms are at that, that we purchase from. And those, those three types of trees take our arid climate fairly well. Uh, and they, as long as you, uh, um, you know, keep them in water, uh, water, uh, supply, they can last for, uh, several weeks. Um, and, uh, but some of the other, uh, uh, trees that are grown in different areas of the country, uh, may not take our arid climate as well. So they would dry out a lot, a lot quicker than the trees that we get from the uh, Northwest. Um, a lot of things like uh, Scotch fir and Fraser fir and things that are grown in the Midwest or the East Coast don't hold up quite as well on the West Coast and the desert areas. So, and we go and check every year up there. We check out the quality of the trees. We uh, check out the uh, the condition of the trees and uh, and just how they're uh, they're uh, graded and uh, marked for uh, for cutting to supply our our stores 
So it's uh, a very great experience to go up and see that. And it, uh, you know, we get a, a lot of firsthand information by uh, talking to the growers, finding out if they've had specific problems mm-hmm. during a season. Sometimes maybe it had gotten too hot and they mm-hmm. did get some tree burn. So they had to rope off a section that they said, no, we're not going to sell these this year. We're going to trim them back and let them grow another season mm-hmm. uh, so that you're only going to get the best quality trees. So, so we've been able to deal with them for several years and we've got a great uh, great uh, understanding and and uh, uh, great relationship with those vendors up there so we've been getting some great quality trees oh. every year and this year does not disappoint they are just just gorgeous so when you pick out a christmas tree understand that there are going to be three different types uh, the doug fir that is the most Christmas smelling one, right? The needles are really thin and it's just the classic Christmas tree. Uh, we sell those. Um, those are the most traditional tree that you could have and they smell so great. Yeah, and then, the fragrance is what people like about those because they do put out a, a, a stronger scent in the house when they're indoors. And then we have the noble fir. And the noble fir is named such because its branches come out and the uh, needles stick straight up and it's very noble. Very proud. Very proud and noble. Very, very firm branching. So you can put heavy, heavy ornaments on that. Lots of light. Lots of lights. (laughs) And then the Nordman, which has become my favorite because it is the longest and it's got such a personality, the Nordman's. Uh, They're a two-tone kind of um, needle. One side is um, very blue green and then the bottom is very silvery so you have kind of the branches are kind of sweeping some uh when i was up at the farm they were saying that just in its nature they vary so you could have some that are kind of a little droopy droopy and some that branches stand real upright and there's really nothing that they do for that that's not a cloning that's that's from seed and they just um that's just the nordman they they all different varieties even color textures uh, in differences that you'll see this year but uh, those will last the longest we have noticed and take it away Paul on how to make sure you keep your trees lasting forever well <laughs> not my not really forever okay but maybe by the new year yeah the, <laughs> the the key things is you want to look for uh, the freshness of the tree rub your hand through the branches um, you know the the needles uh, should stick to them pretty well and, and uh, not have a lot of green needles come off when you're uh, rubbing through them. Uh, you're gonna, you're, you, there's going to be some inner brown needles that, that you shouldn't worry about because w- the lack of sunlight is mm-hmm. going to turn them brown in the middle of the tree. So you're going to have some of that. They try to, when they, when they cut these trees and they get them ready to ship, they actually put them on conveyor belts and they shake them to try to get a lot of the brown leaves in the center of the tree shaken out first. And then they will actually net them in nets that uh, uh, will hold them together so that they're uh, they're, uh, more compact to load on on trucks. Uh, But uh, what you should look for is the freshness. Uh, You should also uh, um, uh, look for the varieties that you like. Uh, like I, uh, Joey Lynn said, the uh, Normans have that two-tone appearance of colors, They're getting more and more popular, I think, every year. Uh, but the key is to, we try to keep as many of these on display in water stands to keep them fresh. Now, when you purchase them, we'll make a fresh cut on the bottom, and you'll want to take them home. Uh, we will actually wrap them in a big plastic bag to keep them from getting wind damage on the way home um, or uh, uh, keeping the needles from dropping off as you take them into your house. Uh, That protects it a little bit. But you want to get them into a water stand as quickly as possible. Um, They can probably go as much as, oh, 30 to 60 minutes uh, uh, before they start 
coagulating mm-hmm. the the sap again after being cut and and you want to start them in warm water so that it loosens that sap up and it makes it more easier for them to to uh, take up that water and even if you're not going to put it in the house right away it is perfectly acceptable to get your tree have the fresh cut done from us and then go right to a bucket outside and that can stay out there for a couple days if you make sure that that water is filled because that tree will actually take water up and that amount of water in the bucket is actually going to decrease so make sure that you keep adding water when the tree comes into your house make sure that you fill that water um, reservoir every single morning um, and check it before you go to bed because at the very beginning the initial um, placement in your house that will take up water very quickly quicker than you really would expect it to yeah and you never want it to go completely dry because once it does then that sap is going to start congelling again and uh, it can prevent the water from uptaking so if it completely dries out and you say oh heck i've got to fill that thing full of water again uh, it may not take mm-hmm. it up after it dries. So you want to make sure that it's kept uh, water in it and don't let it dry completely. Mm-hmm. And if you do let it dry completely, uh, you need to gonna need to use hot water to try to loosen that sap to see if you can get it to, to uptake again. But um, really, if you let it dry out, the best thing you can do is make another cut on it. But mm-hmm. once it's up and decorated, yeah, that's, that's hard kind to of do. a little difficult. It's kind of a little difficult. Um, the other thing to help is placement. Uh, this tends to be some people's last priority is where they're going to place it because they see that big, beautiful bay window in the front and they go, they buy a house because. That's where the Christmas tree is going to go. Um, but we advise you to make sure it's not underneath a vent that has a heater blowing on it. That's going to cause the tree to dry out quicker. Uh, the fireplace, we know we love to have our pretty little fireplaces going, but that fire is going to dry out that tree even quicker. And also a drafty window or front door, um, which is where mine is under a vent by the front door (laughs) in the big the big window but i do lots of water i make sure i always water my tree yeah and by a window isn't bad if you're if it's facing east or north (laughs) because you don't get the direct sun through the window on the tree that's what does the damage Mm -hmm. because it heats up so you don't want it uh, getting direct sunlight through a window so uh, you can put it close, fairly close to a window, but only if it's like on the north side of the house or the east where it's only going to get a little bit of morning sun or, or shaded most of the day. So that's fine to do. But you want to keep it as cool and uh, as uh, draft free as possible because that's what dries it out the quickest. Mm-hmm. Talk a little bit about if somebody wanted to purchase a tree so they could plant it. What would be uh, the best tree for us here? Well, you can use some of the, the pines that are uh, used here in the valley, like the uh, uh, Elderica or Mondale pines. Uh, a lot of uh, um, of the gr- uh, growers... Uh, uh, that that grow them for our regular inventories will actually shear some of them into a more pyramid shape for the holiday season. You can use them indoors for that short time uh, uh, during the holiday season and then take them outside and plant them in your yard. So like the uh, Aleppo pines or the Mondale pines are probably the two best yeah. that we would that we would use here because uh, they both can they can take our growing conditions here. So um, one little interesting fact, because we're talking about Christmas trees and how it really is good for not just the environment, but for these farms to be supporting these businesses and this practice of grabbing your traditional Christmas tree um, is also that out of the 33 million sold, 93% of Christmas trees are recycled through over 4,000 programs that are offered. And if you're in um, our Las Vegas region, this 
is probably going to be very common, um, but maybe some other uh, of our markets don't know that these programs exist for them too. But if you do pick up a live Christmas tree at the end of the season, make sure to take off all the decorations, um, all of the lights, all of the plastic, um, and recycle it. And you can do so through local programs. Our program um, is going to be with conjuncture to Springs Preserve, who will have a Christmas tree recycling drop-off point um, finder on their website. So you can type in your zip code and see the closest drop-off point for you near your home to go and drop off your Christmas tree. Just make sure all the plastic is off, um, any metal, anything like that. You just want it all just the organic material. And what they're going to do with your recycled Christmas tree is uh, chop it up into little tiny pieces. And that's going to be mulch for our local parks and landscapes. And it's just a really good way to keep the cycle going. Um, and it's really beneficial for all of um, us locals because you're experiencing our local landscapes and um, you are helping our local plants and trees. And it's just a great way to get rid of your Christmas tree. Make sure to keep it out of landfills um, and just keep it recycled through the, these programs. Well, now that we've talked about the Christmas trees, the next special thing that for uh, the holidays and especially Christmas are the poinsettias. I mean, all all people who buy a tree are going to buy a poinsettia as well. It's just part of the the Christmas tradition. You know, red poinsettias, or now you can get them in different colors, white, pink. Uh, but still, the red poinsettia is the really basic flower of the of the holiday season. And, and, by, rum and rumor has it, you still have one from last year. Yeah, I do. It it doesn't look very good at this point, but that you can keep them alive for uh, a long period of time uh, by just taking proper care of them. You know, get them in the water when they need it, uh, putting them in a in a location where they don't get a lot of uh, uh, heat or or uh, wind movement. Um, but you can get them to survive for quite a while. So, number one suggestion i have for the poinsettias is, is water them in the sink without the foil wrapped around the base every time you water your poinsettia we want all that water to drain out i think that's the number one thing that people don't do properly is remove the foil so you'll actually take the plant in its little pot put it in your sink put a nice um, reverse osmosis or maybe distilled water um, and moisten the whole soil let all of that water drain once all that water is drained then you're going to put that back into the foil and then you can put it back in part of your display right yep absolutely you want to make sure that uh, that root system gets nice even moisture all the way through so you want to make sure the water drains out all the way through uh, not just give it a little sip every time. It needs enough to get it all those roots nice and moist. And then let it drain and put it back in the foil wrap and then put it back out. Or if you have it in a, a more decorative pot, you want to just make sure that the water all drains in the sink mm -hmm. and then put it back in that decorative pot as well. But uh, yeah, that's the critical thing. You don't want them to dry out completely uh, to the point where they're they're wilting too much because sometimes if they go past a certain point they're they won't respond back but uh, you want to just make sure though that that soil does dry out to the touch a little bit between waterings before you water them again and i think it's important that we just touch on the topic that they are toxic for small animals and children because they have a little bit of a milky, any plant that has a milky extract, we need to be very much aware of who's enjoying them and where they're placed. So they're safe for in the house and uh, with, without issue a lot of the times, but just be very aware of uh, where you place them. Keep them on a shelf if you have young children or young puppies that like to get into them. Right, Paul? Yeah, it's... It it used to be that people thought that they were very toxic, uh, which has been proven not to be. I mean, there's a lot 
a lot of plants that are toxic, but they're toxic to certain degrees. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, the um, uh, poinsettias are in the euphorbia family, which has that milky white sap that comes out. And that on a lot of the euphorbias can be uh, uh, a lot of people that have sensitivity to skin rashes or breaking out uh, or certain other allergies. They're more susceptible to having problems mm-hmm. with that type of thing. Uh, but uh, as far as extreme toxicity, that, that's been proven not to be. Uh, but you do want to be careful, especially around uh, young children uh, or pets, mm-hmm. uh, that they might have an allergic reaction mm-hmm. to that, uh, especially that, that sap uh, that's, that, that, that it puts out. But other than that, I mean, there's, there's really very little problems with them. Even Christmas trees, my first year with my puppy who's now 10 she decides she all of a sudden i see in the middle of the night i go to see her and she's sopping wet and i was like oh my gosh what is going on i thought she had gotten up in the middle of the night and she jumped in the pool the stinker pot was actually ripping off the bottom parts of the christmas tree and chewing on them in the middle of the night and it was (laughs) <laughs> she was toxic and her whole little mouth she had this reaction and it was all slobber i thought she was yeah. jumping in the pool in the middle of the night and it was slobber so even with the christmas tree be aware if you have these young puppies that get into everything you may want to put it on a stand or something yeah or put a little fence around <laughs> put a little it. fence around or lots of christmas presents or there if you, you have go. a cat that likes to hide that's in the right. christmas tree before you recycle your christmas tree make <laughs> shake. sure to check for your cat and um shake it a little bit see if a cat falls out you just want to be careful of these things you'd hate to be the one percent that that's right an and, to, and we're we're not being insensitive to anyone and if this has happened to we're you so we are sorry. so sorry so, sorry. Uh, so not we're not making fun it's it's something to be quite aware of so that's why we did we just want to mention some of the cautions um next we should talk about the christmas cactus oh one other thing on the poinsettias oh yeah that might be interesting for some people is that um um if you look at a poinsettia and that nice color is not the flower The flower is actually the little yellow things right in the middle of that colorful leaves because those are leaves. They're called bracts. That's the part of the uh, the plant that actually colors into the color. And the actual flower that produces the pollen are those little tiny uh, yellow flowers that are right in the middle of that nice colorful display of the bracts. I didn't know that. Interesting. A lot of people don't know that, but it's interesting that the leaf itself is just so red or so pink, like just such a rich color. And I'm trying to think of another plant that would have such a like a thin, papery, like leaf. Or what did you call them? Brax. 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 Yeah. I can't well, even think of a the bougainvillea. Oh yeah, I guess you're right. The bougainvillea mm-hmm. would be the same. Way. Same thing. Yep. I want to talk a little bit about the Christmas cactus. That is such a pretty little plant. They are very but pretty. But they do give a lot of people a lot of heartache. Don't you think? Uh, I don't know why. Uh, because, well, because the to get them to bloom, they do need the right temperature. They, they, they need to be in a consistent area, and they do like to be fertilized, right, Paul? Uh, yeah, that helps. Although... <laughs> I've got three very large ones sitting right in the uh, front window of my house, which faces south. Um, and they are about this big around. And they flower usually a couple of times a year. Well, that's because you're Dr. Q. I know. You're a You know, you have your... <laughs> a green thumb. <laughs> I know. I think that you have... Okay, so this is a perfect opportunity for you to give us the tools so that we can be successful with this pretty little plant. This little plant comes in all kinds of colors, white, pink, there's a fuchsia, there's a lavender. They're just precious, and the blooms are just really, really great. And it's not just the Christmas cactus. There's going to be ones like it 
quote unquote Easter cactus, well, uh, Thanksgiving cactus, and they're basically all the same plant. Right. It's right. just uh, Small it, whenever they bloom, is closest holiday is what they're called. Yeah. Okay, so go for it. Give us the, give us the tools. Doctor to, Q's house. Yes, to, we're, to we need a house call cactus. on our on our cac our Christmas cactus. Actually, the 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 Christmas cactus or zygo cactus are a very common plant. Uh, to a lot of people, they can be uh, grown uh, uh, mostly as an indoor plant. Uh, and, and as long as you've got them uh, where they get a lot of light um, and uh, they get uh, occasional watering, the moisture, just again, you want to let that surface of the uh, soil dry out good to the touch uh, between watering. Uh, plants I have in my house, I water... Uh, depending on the temperatures um, and the time of year, I may water them once a week or every other week. Um, and they, they will, they're like a succulent. They hold a lot of water in their leaves, so you don't have to water them real often. But the sunlight, uh, direct sun, uh, they don't need, but indirect light, they like a lot of indirect light. If you can read a newspaper at arm's length that's enough light for most plants to survive indoors so um well oh, that's a good little trick yeah you and and that's that's true for most plants you don't want them in a dark area because they're not going to fo- be able to photosynthesize but as long as they get uh, a good amount of light they're fine they're they'll grow fine and occasional fertilizing um Mine, I may fertilize uh, once or twice a year is all. But a lot of people, if you want to use a, a houseplant food, you could fertilize them more often. I've found that they really don't need it. But uh, if you have uh, uh, any of the plants that, that are stressing or not doing well, you might want to use a, a root stimulant on them like our Dr. Mm-hmm. Hughes plant tonic uh, a little more often. Uh, it should perk them back up. But I've found that the ones we've had, they do very well. And you can just break off stems, stems of them and root them in a glass of water or in uh, a good potting soil or peat moss or sand. And they will sprout roots and grow very, well, I, very I want easily. some cuttings of yours. Yeah. Um, do do they have much problems with insects or mealybugs or anything like that? Do you uh, run, not mine? Not and yours. I, and I don't spray them with anything. They're they're uh, unless you've got a problem, you know, with insects uh, on any of your other house plants. Then, you know, you might need to spray them with a house plant spray, mm. but only if you notice them on there. Okay, so we want to hear from you if you've never gotten a christmas cactus this is your time go out and get one and let's even if you've never done a house call a house plant before right let's give it a try everybody in the that can hear my voice it's time to try a christmas cactus they're almost as easy to grow as pothos are in the house and that's one of the easiest to grow house plants there is so so if you consider that i mean they they both take about the same uh, care, and it's just that the Christmas cactus actually produce a nice, well, colorful flower. Th- that, and that's the thing is that I thought that it. W- I've I've heard people have problems getting that bloom, and so they kind of they kind of give up. They they buy the plant from us, and it's got all the flowers on it, and quickly they get it home, and all the flowers pop off, and it never blooms again. But that could have something to do with their. Um, the temperature, the practice, if the house is too warm. Or they right? get too much water. Or they get too much water. Well, you're you you're giving us all hope. <laughs> so how big right. can they get, like in terms of height? Height, they can get about a foot and a half. Uh, width, they can probably get about three to four feet across. Oh, wow. So you could have a really large I the, I do plant. have to trim mine back uh, at least a uh, couple times a year break off branches and just snap them right off right at the where they uh where the uh joint <laughs> joint is right yeah i've done house calls i've seen really big ones but 
they were in a corner in direct sunlight and they were never moved. You know, that it was something that wasn't, they weren't moved into the sun and out of the sun and depending on the season. And it was typically the same temperature in the house all the time. And that's a lot of house plants. You know, people go and see all these amazing house plants at hotels and they want that house plant and they think they can't understand why. Well, because the hotels, their temperature never changes. It's always the same temperature inside right the house plants are are never exposed to extreme air conditioning blowing straight on them or a heater in the season or at the kitchen table one day and then we it gets moved to the corner so yeah that's that's the thing about house plants is you want to find the spots that they do the best in and then make sure that you don't constantly change that Mm -hmm. environment because that's when they'll start having a having problems yeah they get a little shock absolutely and then finally we're going to talk a little bit about how to keep our wreaths and our garlands our fresh live wreaths and garlands alive and that's kind of just by misting and um, keeping them moist right if you have your garland wrapped over a fireplace it's going to dry out a lot quicker than um, if it's just on a, a ledge right yeah, absolutely. It's, um, you know, where it's going to get the most heat or, or draft is going to dry it out quicker, just like the Christmas trees, because that's where they come from, is the uh, branches of the Christmas trees. So, so you want to take, take the same care. And if you can, take a little misting bottle and mist them, uh, you know, uh, maybe once a day or every other day. That will actually help keep them a little bit more moist and keep them from drying out as quickly. And if you do get your live wreaths um, and garland, just make sure at the end of the season, if you choose to recycle it through the same programs that you would with your Christmas tree, make sure any inorganic material is taken off of the garland or wreath. So any sort of wires, metal, plastic, anything that can't be broken down um, and used as organic mulch, can't be recycled with it so just be diligent in doing that um, and you'll still be giving back to the community in a way so it's just a great way to keep the traditions going Um, we are so excited to celebrate all the holidays with our customers this month it's going to be such a great month of giving back Um, we do have a lot of programs um, going on in the month of December. So if you're interested in learning more, make sure to be checking our website, which is www.starnursery.com. And also be following us on our socials. We're on Instagram at Star Nursery LV, as well as Facebook at Star Nursery. And if you guys need a house call, you know who to go to. Um, Because the month of December, it gets uh, a little dicey for some plants. So if you're really, really um, worried about your landscape, maybe reach out to uh, what what is the house called um, reaching out or how do you get that process going again? All you need to do is head into your local star nursery location and purchase uh, Dr. Q's house call once. I receive your purchase. I will contact you and make sure that you get on the schedule as soon as possible. If you are in Utah or Arizona, we have different staff that uh, and experts that will perform your house call for you. Uh, but you go into the store. But while you're in the store for the month of December, don't forget to contribute to the Home for the Holidays home with Walker holidays. Furniture. Um, that is our big uh, community outreach that we do here in um, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. It is all the money that we raise at the registers gets divided amongst uh, a couple hundred good um, candidates for the home for the holidays now walker furniture also chooses um actual deserving families where they will put furniture into their home um but 30 30 homes will be uh supplied with furniture from walker and then anything that's left over uh gets distributed and um they get gift cards and all kinds of um 
wonderful blessings that these families are really, really deserving of. And we're very proud uh, to be partnered with Walker Furniture and have, uh, how long have we been partnered with them, Paul? Mm. Since the beginning. I, and I, I'm not sure I think exactly. I, it's been a good, uh, maybe 15, 20 years. Yeah. So great things that Walker Furniture does. So if you're in the store um, anytime this December and you want to uh, contribute and make a donation, uh, we are happy to to take it and uh, make a big part of the big, big gift that we do for everyone. Well, Madeline, Dr. Q, Paul. Yes, Joey. This has been so great. My favorite topic so far, talking about uh, Christmas and the holidays at Star Nursery. Um, we are so thrilled. We just hope that everybody out there has a holiday filled with uh, family and tradition and blessings. And uh, we hope that you can stop by and make us part of your traditions this year. Happy holidays, guys. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Joy Lynn. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.